everybody for this uh, first session after the wonderful keynote. Um, we have three presentations coming up. So first by Brie, 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 <laughs> by Brie uh, Miravel. I will let the speakers introduce themselves, but just briefly so you know. Sure. Then we have um, Solange and Dalton in the second presentation. We will then go to Martina as the third presentation. Um, after the three presentations, then we can have hopefully a little bit of time for discussion. So please hold all your questions until the end. And Melissa would like to give the word to our first speaker. Hi, can you hear me? Okay, is that working? Excellent. Hi, I'm Brie Midavane, and I'm the taxonomist at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. Uh, we're going to be doing uh, Dalton's going to drive for me <laughs> with my slides. So if there's a little, like, if it goes off, then so we, apologies. <laughs> um, I'll be talking about lessons learned uh, during the Art Information Commons Initiative, which is a grant initiative, and it's coming to a close actually at the end of this week. Um, next slide. Um, before diving into the presentation, I, uh, which is actually a companion presentation to another CDOC uh, uh, one that we did back in November of 2020. I do want to give recognition and thanks to the team that has planned, supported, advised, and developed the Art Information Commons over the past five years. Uh, Christina Regina has been the driving force behind this initiative. Um, she is the principal investigator for the grant and the Arcadia Director of the Library Archives at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. Um, our project team, which has consisted of Kristen, myself, and Juliette Venegra, um, and from a wide range of other staff throughout the museum. Our consultants over the course of the grant were designed for context and then talking solutions who worked with advanced services on the prototype, uh, which we'll show. Not shown here are our former, former, our former staff developers, additional library and archive staff, as well as our wonderful external advisory board, which is made up of Rod, Rob Sanderson, Emmanuel Delmas Glass, Nick Honeyset. David Newberry, Liz Ernst, and Maria Matanzo, as well as our internal steering committee who has given us valuable advice and encouragement over the past five years. And then support for this project has been generously funded by the Mellon Foundation. Next. Uh, for those who aren't familiar with our initiative and prototype, many of our art information workflows have grown out of legacy disciplines, which were based on each individual uh, department's professional standards and distinct needs. And that really goes back to what was discussed in the keynote speech this morning. Uh, these workflows uh, met the needs of the analog world, but created siloed and primarily inward facing practices. Kristen, along with Karina and Marge, began the application process for the Mellon Foundation grant in 2018 with objectives for improving the way that we record, access, and share information and resources in and around our collections, as well as to help us to develop a new holistic data governance practices to guide how we create, use, reuse, and manage our assets internally. Uh, we also wanted to learn how we could transform that data to help build the bridges and connect with external communities. The Mellon Foundation supported our work with a three-year planning grant that was then generously extended to five. Uh, there were two main stages. The first focused on exploration, communication, and determining use cases uh, with our consultants designed for context, while the second stage consisted of development of a linked data research environment prototype, which was done with Talking Solutions and Advanced Services. Design for Context uh, led our team in sponsoring many roadshows, activities, and exercises to find out from staff what their needs were for finding and recording information about our collection. Next slide. This process led us to several use cases we could focus on to test a new way to manage our data, improve access, and support our research needs. We decided to build a linked data research tool using a small slice of data that would extend to multiple resources across the museum. By focusing on a small section of our collection, we could assess the feasibility of implementation on a larger scale determining if it would be scalable or extensible in the long term, and it would allow us to investigate the, in detail the integrity of our data and its ability to be transformed into linked data on a larger scale. Next slide. We focus on data representative of Black art artists' histories and representation. We chose this because its data spans all departments and file types, 
affects the work of staff across the museum, including research by fellows, educators, and non-traditional researchers. And in particular, it supports the work of an internal Black representation in our working group. It would let us address institutional and civic priorities of ongoing inequities by improving data quality, enhancing content, and addressing our homogenous metadata. To do this, we integrated data across systems, pulling and connecting resources from our collection database, conservation data, education materials stored in shared drives, library data, archives data, and finally images from our digital asset management system into the prototype, making what was once only searchable and siloed in individual databases searchable in a single system. We looked to conceptual reference modeling like linked art and CDOC to describe our data so we could deeply explore the relationships between resources and events in order to give context to our objects. This is especially important in our art collections created by artists of color, where unknown artists require contextual information to improve access and clarity. For example, we hoped it would, it would allow us to relate objects to the enslaved peoples who created them and give cultural context to objects where that information might be lacking in the tombstone information. After determining our use case and vision, the next step was to find consultants and developers who could work on the linked data environment prototype using a request for information process. We chose Talkin Solutions out of a pool of five vendors to build it. And if you want to know more about their work, you can connect with George Rusker, pictured here, along with his partner, uh, who is giving a number of presentations during this conference. Uh, they worked on transforming our, our data using the aforementioned CDOC and linked art ontologies to create connections between the data in our various systems. This is just showing some of the mapping that they did. This modeling helps us to understand the nature of linked data and highlighted the fact that so much of the necessary and nuanced data used to describe our collections is understandardized in text and free text fields and therefore hidden and not easily accessible in a linked data environment. And in the end, in the end, even while limited by former data practices, we were still able to connect vast amounts of resources and information surrounding our collection together. Uh, Taken worked with Advance uh, to bring that modeling into our virtual research environment prototype based on the open source tool called Research Space. The VRE is currently only available internally to staff holders as it is just a prototype and not actually implemented in full measure. But it was built to share more broadly in the, with the future in mind. Um, if you could just click, it should start a video. Yay. Um, okay, so advanced worked on um, giving us three main options for searching in the VRA, a, uh, a regular like Google type search, which is at the top of uh, these boxes, which you see are also links to our collections. We have links to an about page that tells us what our goals were and has different types of documentation included in it, um, which is helpful for getting context about the project. Uh, as you can see, these are some of our collection uh, buckets. Uh, they are all collection buckets based on linked art buckets. And when you click into them, you get a list of our objects from that bucket. We have little icons on the right hand side. And those are, they tell us what is uh, where each of uh, piece of data comes from in our source systems, which leads to transparency in our data. We have filters on the side, which are dictated by uh, linked art properties, uh, which allow our users to um, filter down into these larger sets of, um, of information. When we go into a records, uh, a record for an art object. Uh, we have things organized in a way that is most important information with less important information or more specialized information below the fold at the bottom. Um, and that was something that was requested through feedback with uh, our, our users. Um, we can also go to um, different uh, exhibitions when we're talking about uh, artworks and that can then lead you down a rabbit hole of research. Uh, you can also look for our uh, buckets of like people associated with authority records. And so when you click into that, you will come into a person record, uh, which it might 
oh no, big screen, <laughs> um, which you get a list of this, you click into a person record and it will allow you to find all of the information about that person. Uh, you can also click into uh, and find people just by typing in their name and it will take you to the record that's associated with their name. Um, but it also brings back other things associated with them. And so you have to kind of look for it on the tab. Uh, when we click into this Horace Pippin record, you can see that up on the left, there's a view vocab button, and that links directly into Getty. And so that will take the users directly to an authority record that they can then see um, more information about that person. Um, and I think you can just hit next. Uh, the next thing I'm going to show you is one of the other searches that we allow, and this is the contextual search. So this is our what we call like our easy Sparkle query or a visual Sparkle query that's put together. So it's built basically um, so that you build a sentence uh, to find your information. So if you hit next again. Uh, so it goes through our buckets. It will go through our filters, which are based on those linked art properties and classes. Uh, in this case, we're looking for information about our um, about African American women artists. So we can uh, look for them through ethnicity and through gender. The thing to keep in mind for like our data set is it's based on our data set. So if we have that information, then we can look for it. But if we don't have the information, then we can't find it. Uh, so that kind of showed us some of the uh, uh, difficulties of our data in transforming it into linked data. Um, can hit next. And then for more advanced users, we have an actual uh, preloaded query catalog, a uh, Sparkle query catalog, which can allow users to use or build on already formed queries to fit their needs. These range from simple queries, which might need to be done often, to more complicated queries that would be time consuming uh, to build in the contextual search. Uh, Advance also created uh, a system for users to add new data, and it ensures that data goes through a vetting process. Source systems data, uh, so that source system data is not overwritten in our database uh, because that was a concern for our users. And authorship could be applied. Any added data must be approved before becoming available in the VRE. So we're still trying to work through some old ideas of how we work things in our data to new technologies. Um, assertions, which is this is the form for assertions, are made on data that already exists, uh, but doesn't have any standardized way for it to be entered into our systems of record. Um, and these happen on a field by field basis. And you should be able to put um, No, you, you're good. <laughs> uh, back. But, yeah. Yes. Uh, new data forms for artwork, persons, places, materials, and conservation data are used to add data that does not already exist in pre-existing source systems or doesn't have a way to be entered into those systems, uh, but it would be helpful for research. Shown here are um, some fields which are included in the new artwork form. Uh, our clear DLF postdoctoral postdoctoral fellow in data curation for African-American studies, Dr. Sinatra Smith, entered some of her research that she's done for the museum on black artists using these forms. Um, since it's a prototype, the UX design was a little clunky and difficult for her to navigate, but the ability to be able to search the new data that she entered is helpful. Um, so that was the feedback that we received from her. Next slide. In the final phase of the grant, we incorporated some of our other use cases by improving our data governance and interoperability. Implementation of the dams, which had been in progress since 2019, helped us to better understand the vocabularies used to describe and access our collections, as well as provided valuable API access for our prototype and other systems, further increasing the interoperability between our tools and data set, databases. We use this understanding to build vocabularies for tags, filters, and drop-down menus in the dams. So this is all work that was done in conjunction with the prototype that I just showed you. Um, we also use these uh, to test and use another open source tool called OpenTheso to build taxonomies and thesauri in an environment that allows for the sharing of those vocabularies using RDF and CSV exports. And this is what's on the, the right. 
Uh, another system to benefit from this work is our current project supported by the grant to improve our conservation data by moving it out of a database, which is being sunset to one that is cloud-based and user-friendly. Previous work done on the dams and on the prototype uh, helps us to understand how our conservation data can be improved, especially through the migration process by reusing that data that we had been exploring and taking advantage of the APIs built into the dams. We also created long-term working groups to help us understand our data and improve our governance and best practices, as we know this is necessary for when we want to eventually share out our prototype. Uh, our bias remediation for interpretation and data innovation team created a guide to help us proactively and consistently remedy biases in the ways we record and present data and images. This was the tangible result of multiple conversations occurring at the museum in different departments on similar topics. We are planning to continue with these internally, as well as create a forum for the GLAM community. Metadata and Governance Group was formed, and it used to focus on dams implementation, but now that we've squeaked past that, uh, is shifting priorities to assess and align our data policies, style guides, and overall governance as our data becomes increasingly interconnected and reused. As a part of the grant and the work on bias remediation, we organized our third and final symposium on identity, ethics, and insight. This symposium was particularly focused on the work being done at various institutions on bias remediation. It was highly successful. And if you're interested, I have included links in the uh, to the recording and the resources discussed. So when this presentation is shared, you'll be able to find those. So lessons learned. Uh, we kind of put these lessons learned into three buckets. Um, as you know, or may not know, <laughs> if you have ever done a tech build, it always takes more time than you think it's going to. Uh, it's just the nature of it. So please schedule in just some extra time for that planning, um, especially for technical glitches, unexpected downtime, staff outages, changes in staff capacity. Uh, we also had a great partnership with our consultants, but we did not have an in-house developer. Uh, this was a huge deficit when creating something that is so tech heavy, um, as we did not have anyone advocating on our behalf, translating between the needs of the consultants and our IIT department, um, or to help troubleshoot any issues. Uh, so that was definitely probably the biggest one that we learned. On a project like this, having a diverse skill set was really important. We had skilled data modelers and ontologists uh, uh, with talking solutions. For a brief moment, we did have an in-house developer, so we got a taste of what that collaboration could look like, and we were very sad when it, when it was ended. Um, a specialist taxonomist and metadata person, let's see, uh, to understand our data fields and tying these systems together internally, and to round things off, someone with a grand vision and big picture who kept us on track and uh, in scope, uh, both of which are vital to success. Our team changed over the years as needed for work being done, so being flexible was very important. Um, and it allowed us to shift our goals when met with the unexpected. Um, and the planning grant was really great because it allowed us to test things and then discard them if they weren't useful. This method helped us to find some great tools in the process. For example, our open theso taxonomy management. Um, the second bucket is uh, just our data. We learned a lot of things about our data. A lot of it we pretty much thought it was there, but it was really proved through this process. Our data is nuanced, and that nuance is usually recorded in those free text fields um, because usually that's the only option. Um, and this limits uh, this, the limits of our current system dictated the level of ease of data transformation into linked open usable data. Um, for some of our databases, it was easier than others. As we hoped, transforming our data highlighted previous practices that could either help or hinder our teams, our efforts to connect our data in such a standardized way. Understanding this is crucial um, to changing practices to make our data shareable and reusable in the future. Um, we are in the process of using what we learned to evaluate what data practices and standards will need to be updated for easier sharing. And focusing on a small subset of data was fundamental for finishing the prototype on time and to be able to test it. Additionally, it made us realize how big of a job updating our data and our data practices really is. Um, because it wasn't in scope, we were unable to make those changes for the prototype. Um, leading to lesson four, which is it's easier to update data practice when moving to a new system. 
uh, than to change workflows for existing systems. It's also easier if everyone on board enjoys what they're doing. The work being done on bias remediation encouraged workflows to change, even without a new system to encourage it. And then examining controlled vocabularies in multiple systems and workflows is what has enabled some of the most basic sharing between systems. Working to define our terminology was important, especially when there were variations in definitions between departments. These nuances and terms can also dictate how information is recorded as data, further impacting data transformation. And then our last lesson um, is communication. A tech-heavy prototype can be difficult for staff to uh, grasp. So sharing our out progress regularly over time was necessary. Uh, this allowed us to reach most of the staff in the institution, but the complexity of the technology required more trainings than we prepared for. We also learned that high turnover in staff and the shift of priorities that come with new museum leadership, as with the, was the case in our institution, requires additional communication that will need to happen over time to show the value of the project. Learning how we can leverage the work we have done to speak to these new, pr new priorities will be necessary for the prototype to grow beyond its current scope. Showing what the prototype could do was far more effective than telling everyone what it could do. So once we actually had something to show, people started understanding the value of what we were creating. So find your champions. These are people who are excited about and understand the value of the project. They help encourage and teach other staff members and are invaluable for enriching the work uh, that is being done. And that was Dr. Sinatra Smith for us. Um, their excitement helps others get excited and encourages them to learn more. Find the community that is doing the same work. It is helpful to see what other institutions are doing with the same technology and you get ideas too. In the fourth year of the grant, we held monthly check-in calls with the Mellon Foundation with other Mellon Foundation grantees. This allowed us to talk about the similarities in our initiatives and brainstorm solutions or share conferences and symposiums that might be helpful in our endeavors. Um, thanks for listening. And I've included uh, this information here so that when the presentation is made available to you, you can find our re recordings and our documentation. And I guess we'll have questions at the end. Thank you. Mm -hmm. oh. <laughs> so, uh, so, hi, um, I'm over here. <laughs> oh. Hi, wow. um, Chris, that was really interesting, and and it was particularly interesting for me because I'm the designer of research base. Um, seeing seeing what other people are, are doing with it, um, I did, but I, but I, then it, it I automatically then want to ask questions about that, that process. Um, it was a prototype. I noticed that there were lots of things that you weren't using that are in research base in, in, in the things that you, you were doing. And I wondered what, what the constraints were for you, what the problems you had in, in implementing in, in your timescale um, and, and why, why you didn't actually use some, more, some, of, more, some of the other features of research base in, in the system. I think it really boiled down to just running out of time at the end of the grant and realizing that we just did not have the capacity to implement anything beyond just some of the basics of, of the research space open source tool. Um, it, it really boiled down to just that. Um, we just not having an in-house developer really hampered that sort of um the collaboration that would allow things to move much more swiftly when we were building the the prototype. So I think it was we're a new institution who doesn't have a lot of uh, we're an institution new to the idea of this advanced technology. So there weren't internal systems in place that we could rely on for those the sort of needs that this sort of tech build required. And not having that, um, I think, kind of limited our scope that we were able to do to do with us. But I, I really think on top of that, it was just we were running out of time. And, and what tech took longer? Was it the data normalization and cleaning or was it the development of the system? What was the first part of the question? Was it the data cleaning 
and and transformation, or was it the, the the implementation of the system that took the most time? I think it's the implementation of the system that really? took the longest for us. Like the actual like getting the uh, communicating with the developers that we were working with who were overseas and getting that particular aspect of the the tech build. Okay. Together. Okay. That's surprising. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Uh, good morning, buenos dias. I would like to thank you for the opportunity, the organizers, and I would like to introduce myself. I am Solange, I am teacher of history and a curator of visual materials in, at the Museu Paulista da USP, it's a museum that belongs to the University of Sao Paulo. And uh, we are presenting here with my colleague, and also another colleague, Luciana Martins, that will not be with, with us. And I will read to stay on time. Well, um, I would like to start presenting the museum for, don't know, the museum. Museu Paulista is one of the oldest pub public museums in Brazil. It was created in 1993 as a museum of natural history. And research and education always uh, were among its main goals. During the 19th century, as a result of the specialization of knowledge, its collection of zoology, botanic, and ethnography was transferred to new institutions. It was integrated to the University of Sao Paulo in 1963, and since 1919, it's a museum specialized in history and material culture, Next, <laughs> and material culture with focus on history of the imaginary, daily life and domestic space history and labor history. Our collections are formed by around 80,000 iconographic documents, uh, 30,000 and also a archive around uh, 600 linear meters. Our database was created in 1993. Uh, our catalog was formed in the Visual Fox Pro, and our catalog was formed by 85 metadata, metadata organized in 13 sections in order to represent the social cycle of object life. So th this is our intentions to give dynamic to this and to the research that is about that's doing uh, about the, the objects. And so from production to discard. And between 2021 and 2022, we developed a project to migrate our local database to the Pinacan platform. And uh, this is our numbers, it was a, a very complex process. And uh, for the huge collections that it was in our uh, primary database. And this project was developed by Perseb Research Consultants and Training Educational. It's an enterprise uh, coordinated by Luciana Martins that signed this paper with us. And Pinacan project from the uh, University of Brasilia, Dalton is the coordinator. And partnership with a foundation uh, that supports um, uh, Museu Paulista, the Universidade, uh, and uh, under the um, and the, the institutional coordination of Museu Paulista Working Group for Digital Strategies. The project was sponsored by in two phases. In the first phase, by the State of Sao Paulo annual public notice in 2021, and in the second phase by the United States Consulate in 2022. And uh, well, the new repository opens uh, many possibilities for educational activities and disseminations of the results of research and curatorship uh, projects about our collections. And that uh, since the beginning of this year, uh, it was possible to implement seven digital exhibitions that present the results of research and curatorial projects in progress. And I would like to show the our database. Hope it's open. Oh, okay. Ah, yes. Yes. Uh, well, this is our our site. 
uh, and I would I would show the we, we call curadorias digitais, um, so uh, digital exhibitions. And please, could you enter in this the uh, curadorias? And um, this is the way that we can disseminate our uh, research results. And as uh, our collections are so diverse, it's a way to select. And so we have here, um, it's possible to select by a typology of document like postcard, and then you can go to the, the item. So you have texts about the postcards and also you can go directly for the online catalog, like this, with all the, the images. And the other one, you know, um, other um, other exhibitions for could be by uh, relate, related to a subject, a specific subject, like uh, another one. <laughs> This one about, uh, for instance, a place in São Paulo, and then you can go through different documents like photographs, paintings, and graves, and also um, um, from different periods. And then you can research different documents about the same site, the same site of uh, São Paulo, and also other example that I would like to show, that I highlight particularly, <laughs> it's about um, all this, this equipment of uh, kitchen. And then also this object um, curatorship, talking about, and this is in the way that you can enter in the catalog, clicking uh, in one of the images. And then you can have information about this from our catalog. So the, these exhibitions are very important for us because it's a way to, to present to the general public how diverse are our collections and um, also to disseminate the research that are been doing for our students because all the seven uh, uh, digital exhibitions uh, were made by students or postdoctoring students and uh, or master students that is working with us in the museum. And just one more because I have <laughs> three minutes. <laughs> I'll um, this. Um, for instance, this one we can uh, is an investigation about the photomechanical process that we have a lot of photomechanical process and uh, to teach how to recognize different photomechanical process, and then we can uh, like this right the reticles different reticles like color type or rot gravel or of. And then we can, can you click here? And then we can um, add the, the image, the, this technical image of, from my, microscope to teach how to recognize different process, photomechanical process in our collections. So, so different kinds of digital exhibitions that can um, invite people, invite the researchers to know better our collections and and now thank you Dalton and now um I would like Dalton will talk about the methodology and the, the technical procedures for this migration with very com complex and then uh, we had all the, the our teams involved in this uh, but also a very technical procedures Dalton thank you Martins from City of Brasilia. It's very nice to be here. So many colleagues from Mexico and other countries, and we are very happy to present this work in CEDOG. So our main question was at the time how to migrate from a technology created in 90s, uh, like Visual Fox Pro which was mailing a software to use an administrative sense from the museum to a new platform, uh, which is mainly based in technology on the web, like WordPress and Tynacam plugin. 
which is a digital repository solution that we developed in our university and we are using in so many public museums and private museums in Brazil that are mainly related with uh, public policy conducted by Brazilian Institute of Museums to disseminate the software and offer some technical support and kind of capacitations and many online classes to help uh, museum institutions in Brazil to adopt and uh, migrate their collections to the software. So how to do that? We, we had a time an idea that many thousands of registers and information on FoxPro needed to be cleaned, needed to be uh, transformed, needed to pass by a, a whole data science process to go online and become a very useful and a very powerful information, as we can see uh, in which Solange presents to us right now. So uh, we we are in university, we began to make a research, which kind of process, which kind of technical process and a workflow process could work in our situation. And we found some um, many related questions in the data mining process created uh, at the end of the 90s, at the beginning of the 2000 years, uh, in which they had the same same problem, not related to digital repositories, but related how to migrate, how to integrate different information systems in a whole uh, information systems, in a new information systems, could be aggregate different kinds of information. So we found this uh, CRISPDM, which is a cross-industry standard process for data mining, which was created by EBM uh, to help different kind of uh, companies, institutions migrate data and create a process to explore data. But we translated this process to a, a new workflow that we developed here. And we are using this workflow to understand data from the legacy database from the museums institutions and how to migrate the new information to WordPress and to Tynacan in a mainly web-based solution. So we begin uh, the first steps in this methodology is called business understanding. Uh, we pass three steps in, at this time, trying to understand the institution, understanding their practice, the information practice, how they treat the information, how they use it, the database, and we try to describe all the, the tables in their database, all the metadata fields, how they use, how they create, how they uh, catalog information. We can do a very, very deep description of their information practice at this level. After that, we pass to a new uh, phase, which is called data understanding. And we understand their syntactic and semantic practices how they use control vocabularies, how they use different kinds of patterns or standards related to different policies, uh, mainly based on the institution or based on, on an external international institutions. After that, and only after that, it's very important to say that because we don't put our hands on the data, we don't use any kind of technical solution or scripts before understand in a very deep way the data that we have on the museum. So in the next step, uh, which is called data preparation, we have three main uh, courses in our workflow. The first one is extraction, how to extract information from the legacy uh, solutions. And we are talking here not to extract just the metadata fields, just the metadata information, but how, how to extract the media because the museum have uh, many different projects to create media, to digitalize the media, to store this media in different kinds of solutions. Some ones related to database, some ones related to solutions on the cloud. So how we can collect and integrate all this information from metadata and from the media. After doing that, we pass to a new and a very, very, uh, in my opinion, the main the most important phase on this process, which is called transformation. And we have two ways to flow from this workflow. One is working with media. Media has many problems. 
Uh, we need sometimes to group media because media was based in very different strategies to organize in directories and subdirectories. We need to group that, organize that conversion of many types of data fields and digital files, work with compressed media, integrated media, and or normalize the media names to put them in relation with the IDs from the, the registers on the database. And the second one, the second flow here, we work with metadata. Uh, we transform the, all the tables in tight data, which is data prepared to be analyzed and to be transformed using data science uh, procedures. We transform values, we normalize values, and using many, many different solutions, but mainly in Python and OpenRefine, and integrated both uh, in a workflow to automatize some procedures that we organize together. Uh, we group terms, we have so many, we use so many uh, machine learning algorithms to identify terms that could be grouped, that could be translated one to another. And after that, we put all this information together uh, from the, the media files and from the metadata fields, and we can do uh, a mass upload of information of media files to WordPress and use Tynacan as a digital repository to reorganize the information in this new platform that Solange presents to us. So uh, we developed this methodology. Uh, we used this methodology in, at the beginning with Paulista Museum at Sao Paulo, but we are using this methodology in so, in so many museums, more than 30 at the time. And it, it's something that helped us to train new technical people to understand what the, what is expected the, from them to do in, in a whole project and how we can check all the, the steps if we are doing a correct way, in a very technical way, in applying the best procedures that we are developing here. So uh, at the end of the process, we, are, we have all the data migrated from a, a legacy data, a database, which in, in this situation was FoxPro, to a web platform which is mainly based in WordPress and Tynacan. So it's yeah. that's it. Yeah. Uh, we have our the names of our team here. I don't know if you can present mm -hmm. someone. Oh well, um, well all the teams are very very involved and this is a kind of lesson too <laughs> because uh, otherwise it would be impossible to do this kind of analyze uh, of cleaning data and metadata and discuss and Tatiana is here, even though that the assistance of our coordination of this group. And uh, that is, this is the our, and also Luciana that is not here. And uh, Suelani that is here too, working in the university. So it's a great team working with us. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you. Okay. 
Who's this one? Who's this one? Yes. Okay. Hello, everybody. Let me first introduce my country and a museum where I'm working in a documentation for more than two decades. I'm coming from Slovenia, small Central European country with two million inhabitants and many museums. One of those is a Technical Museum of Slovenia. It is one of state museums specialized in technical heritage on a territory of Slovenia. It is situated in a, in a historical medieval building uh, in an ex cartesian monastery in a nice natural environment. It is a popular destination. Annually, we have 40,000 visitors. Main collections are woodworking, hunting, fishing, agriculture, te textile, electrical engineering, road uh, traffic, printing, post and telecommunications, and some other sm smaller ones. Annual budget is 1.8 uh, million euros. The museum is funded mostly from public funds, 85%. In the museum, there are 31 uh, full-time employees, eight curators of collections, and only two, two documentalists. Only three persons are younger than 35 years. We are quite an old team. The museum has uh, 20,000 objects of technical heritage from main collections. In the documentation department, we preserve paper inventory books and with my, my colleague, we are managing the database with records of objects. Photo library is the most important collection uh, and most frequently used. At the moment, we, are, uh, we have around 100,000 items, digital items in a database. From old analog material, we preserve a collection of photographic negatives, positives and photographs. Uh, that was created by, by curators during 70 years of operation of museum. We also have two special uh, photographic collections of successful and also international known Slovenian industries, motorcycle factory Tomos Koper and Iskra Kran, factory for electrical engineering and fine mechanics. Both are from the period of ex-Yugoslavia, the state we were part of until 1991. In the first period, documentation was, uh, of course, paper-based, made by handwriting uh, or taped, uh, typed with a typewriter. Curators made black and white photographs of objects in a collection, later on colored one. Documentation of museum objects was managed separately by each curator of the collection. Every curator has his own inventory book of evidence for evidence of objects in, in the collection. In 1956, they set up a museum process of documenting of an, of an object according to the legislation and museum standards of the time. 
Documentation of Kuto Library was managed centrally from the beginning, from 1953 on, in the documentation department where we keep inventory books of photo library. Documentation of museum objects in paper form is various and very important. Curators now need to digitize it and integrate it into the database to ensure the continuity of documentation of an object. The main objective is a comprehensive documentation of cultural heritage. In 202, we stopped to document museum objects on paper records and started to do it digitally in the first museum documentation database. At the beginning, we have, a, have put a lot of effort to adjust it to the specifics of our museum organization of work and collections. We made an important three-level professional classification of collections following the example of Deutsches Museum in Munich and adjusting it to our collections. The first database for documenting museum collections was Museiskes Birke Museum Collections. In 1997, we began with test digitizing of part of the photo library. Then in 202, the digitization of museum objects started. Starts. Major upgrade of database and move to Windows environment was done in 209. Database was also renamed to Kronos and became reachable on the internet. This year, third major upgrade of Kronos added new automatization and functionalities, some artificial intelligence. One of the questions that was raised during this road of digitization is how to motivate curators to focus more on documentation. One of basic professional obligations of curators is to identify and document objects of cultural heritage, but they are not motivated to do the documentation part. Why? Unattractive, time-consuming work, not rewarded as making exhibitions and catalogs, research projects, etc. Computer-based documentation systems make this work easier but museum standards are also more demanding and complex. We are obliged to collect more data than ever. Slovenia is the part of the common European digital space where library archives and museums and galleries participate. Slovenian museums and technical museum of Slovenia are improving accessibility of museum collections through digital documentation on digital on different platforms such as Europeana and museum web pages. Here you see some artifacts of geodetic collections we were digitizing last year in cooperation with surveyors. Sharing knowledge on museum website is our priority. Only a minority of museum objects are displayed in the museum. Most are kept in museum depots which are not accessible to the public. Therefore, every year we present more units in, of technical heritage on the museum webpage. In Slovenia, we have a portal for cultural heritage, e Dediština. It is a common data platform for cultural heritage of Slovenian heritage organizations. The basis for the establishment of the platform is the register of cultural heritage immovable, intangible, and movable, which already contains basic data ca uh, about cultural heritage units. It ensures an optimal use of resources, finances, personnel, time, knowledge, access to advanced technologies, and is a guarantee of a safe, long-term preservation for all heritage organizations. This is an example from this data platform. The role of museum objects object is a, in a contemporary museum changed. Objects of cultural heritage that museum collect are not uh, the center of attention anymore as they were decades ago. Museums change to places of social interaction, uh, meetings, happenings, exciting learning and play, exchange of knowledge, etc. But this fact does not mean that collecting of objects and them, uh, documentation is not important anymore. On the contrary, this is still the basis of every museum. But now we all want stories. In our exhibitions and educational programs, we use stories for attractive interpretation. Curators in contemporary museums 
collect not only material heritage, but also intangible one, merit, memories and traditional knowledge that also have to be documented. At the same time, museum standards also developed and became more complex and demanding. Because of this, the documentation systems have incorporated new IT technologies, but doing documentation still takes a lot of precious curators' time. To conclude, our objectives are to raise the quality of museum documentations, to speed up doc digitization, integrate digital documentation, to acquire a professional studio photography of museum objects, to motivate curators to do documentation more regularly and better to make education programs for curators and other museum professional staff about new technologies to develop their com competencies in that field. This year we celebrate 70 years of opening the first exhibition for visitors. We are planning big changes in following years. The main museum building is going to be renovated and we are preparing also new permanent exhibition. The administration of the museum is going to move from Ljubljana, the capital, to Bistra, where the collections and visitors are. Documentation department will hopefully get modern premises according to professional standards, hopefully with additional staff we need, a photographer and IT pro. These changes will be an opportunity to review museum processes, and improve documentation practices to make more contributions on technical heritage in Slovenia on different web platforms. We plan to speed up computer-based re registration and catalog cataloging of museum uh, material to make more digitization and integrate paper documentation in a database. All this creates better possibility to participate in international, international projects about sharing knowledge of technical heritage in Slovenia on different web platforms. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> Thank you very much. I think uh, we perhaps have, we can steal a couple more minutes for questions. Are there questions from the audience? I know a couple of questions were already posed, but are there other questions? I think everybody's ready for coffee. <laughs> All right, well, thank you very much. And um, let's continue then the questions and the conversations outside with coffee. Okay, thank you. 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 Thank you.